take our Bibles and turn to 2 Corinthians. Uh, we're going to pick up pretty much where we left off last um, Wednesday, and we're going to continue all the way up to verse 9, and then we're going to pick up at verse 9 probably next week and just sort of keep marching through because all this ties together, obviously. Um, it's such a joy to be able to teach this and, and study this section. I've just personally, you know, last week and the week before that, and even today, just looking at all, looking at what Paul wrote here, it's super encouraging just to think about how, uh, what our hope is as Christians, uh, to really consider how Paul thought uh, about his own um, spiritual state, how Paul thought about himself after. You know, he would die, his hope, the same hope he has, we have, and how he is just passionate about relaying uh, the truth that he uh, knows so well to the churches that he loves so much. So I hope this is a, a blessing to you as well. So we're going to look at verses 6 through 10. We're going to read verses 6 through 10, and then we're going to sort of just camp out on uh, verses 6 through 8, because that's a bit, uh, really the heart of where we're at tonight. Paul writes this starting in verse 6. He says, Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. In our discussion over these past eight or nine weeks, we've been talking about the doctrine of sanctification. We've been looking at the scriptures and what they say about our spiritual growth, what God is doing in our lives uh, every day, every hour, every moment that we're alive, God is stretching us. He is uh, putting his spiritual vice around your life to mold and shape you into the image of Christ. He's taking his divine chisel and hammer, and he's applying that to your life to make you like Jesus. That's what the doctrine of sanctification is you know, all about. And we started this by looking at it from an eternal perspective. We've talked about this in a real life perspective, like looking at the point of conversion to the point of our death. We, like, what is God doing in that realm? He's growing us, He's using everything providence, people, circumstances to shape and mold us into the image of Christ. God is using His Word, He's using the Spirit. I mean, these are things we've talked about. Um, We've just looked at sanctification from many different facets, and I hope it sort of helped you think about where, where God has you and what God is doing today in your life, helping you see everything from a biblical perspective, that we're not products of fate, and we're not, you know, the things that come our way in life are not just arbitrary and don't have purpose and meaning, but they do. If you're a Christian, because all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And we hold on to that truth. We quote it a lot, but I don't think we marry that with the doctrine of sanctification like we should. Um, we've been talking about this doctrine. We've been learning a lot about it. But one area of discussion we have not talked about much is the concept of spiritual graduation. And what do I mean by that? I mean being able to die and go to heaven, right? That's spiritual graduation. This past weekend, we were able to celebrate Noah's graduation from the Citadel. We were so thankful that these past four years flew by pretty quickly, and we're able to see him graduate, and hopefully he will get a job now. <laughs> Uh, but we don't really talk about the believer's graduation out of this life into the next. We tend to steer away from that kind of conversation, don't we? And we, uh, we do 
say things like, you know, that help give us some comfort for the here and after. Uh, we, we, we allude to those things, but do we really contemplate life after death? Do we really understand if you are a Christian uh, or not a Christian, there is life beyond the physical realm. There is a whole spiritual world that we cannot truly see. We understand it. We feel it. We feel the weight of it in our hearts and in our consciences. We feel those things, but we don't often really contemplate uh, that there is life after death. If you're a Christian and you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, your hope is that when you take your last breath, whenever it will be, you will enter into the presence of the Lord. But if someone doesn't know Jesus, um, they will enter into the presence of eternal punishment. They will enter into hell or Hades. They will enter, enter into an existence that they've never known before. It will seem, it will not, it won't be some mystical, philosophical experience. It will be a real life experience that, where you will suffer immensely. So those are the two outcomes that you have. That's it. Uh, if you die, you will end up in one of those two places. But for the Christian, death is the gateway to enter into the state of glorification. And we talked a little bit about this last time where we're looking at Paul's desire to be married with his resurrected body. He doesn't want to be unclothed. He wants to be clothed. He, he doesn't want to just die. He wants to actually be with Jesus, but be with Jesus in his completely glorified state. That's everybody's desire, should be, that should be all of our desire, and that's what Paul wished for and hoped for and looked forward to in verses 1 through 5 of this chapter. But Paul um, sort of switches gears here in verse 6 through verse 9 and, and takes a different turn, talking about death, talking about the here and af hereafter, talking about life after death. He's still speaking about that, but Paul is looking at this in a very practical way, though. But as I said a while ago, death is not always that happy subject, is it? We, we don't, as Christians, look at death with a smile on our face, and I think that's a wrong attitude, right? We need to look at death with a smile, with a victorious smile. Yeah, there is grieving when a Christian dies because we will miss them. But guess what? They're, they're in a much better place, right, than this earth. And whenever you talk to people in the world and talk about death, you know, it's always shrouded with much fear, misunderstanding, all kinds of things. Anytime I go to drill and talk to this one individual, he always says, you know, a day above ground is a good day. And I agree with him for his sake. Without Jesus, that is a good day. Because once he dies without Christ, and I'm working on him, praying for him, he will experience torment like he's never experienced. But for the Christian, though, we have a whole different perspective than that. We long for death. Paul longed for death. He saw death as the consummation of God winning. Look at uh, 2 Timothy with me, chapter 4. In verse 18, listen to what Paul says about death. Look what he says in verse 18. The Lord, speaking to Timothy, will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. What is Paul's attitude there? He's in prison. He is in the worst human position, potentially, but what does Paul say? Paul's like, dude, the Lord is going to rescue me out of this world into heavenly bliss, is what Paul is saying. He was prepared to die. He was happy with this idea. Dear friend, are you tonight happy with the concept that you will die? 
Are you ready to die? Are you ready to embrace death with a smile on your face? Paul was. He says here in verse 18 very clearly that the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and He will bring me safely to His heavenly kingdom. Look at Philippians chapter 1 for a minute. We've looked at this a couple of times through the, through the Wednesday nights. But I want you to see Paul's attitude about death here in verse 21. He says, "For we know this verse, we quote it, Christians quote it quite frequently. And if you don't know this verse and you don't have it memorized, shame on you. You should. He says this, For to me is li- to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which to choose, but I am hard-pressed for both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Can't you just hear Paul? He is longing for the day to see the Lord. He's longing to see Jesus, right? He is so focused in his relationship with Christ that he says, I am hard-pressed in both directions. Like, I want to leave. I'm ready to go. As I sit here chained to this Roman soldier, I am ready to die. I'm ready to be with Jesus. But I know for your sake, it's better for me to be here. This is what he says. So was Paul ready? Was Paul ready to die? He was. Shouldn't this be our hope as well? Shouldn't this be our attitude as well? It should be. We should be, we should relish the day that the Lord takes us home. Whether it be in natural death and we go to be with Jesus or it be in the rapture of his church. And we are transformed in the twinkling of an eye and then are with Jesus. We should long for both of those realities. Well, here in chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians, verse 6 through 9, or verse 6 through 8, Paul is talking about death. He is talking about the inevitability of death and, and its components and what are perspective ought to be when we think about it as as Christians. So tonight, here in verses 6 through 9, I want us to think about what Paul says here. There's really just two things to consider tonight as we look at this. Two matters, and they have to deal with perspective, really. Paul has a perspective here that I think he wants his readers to understand. The first perspective I want you to see is the right perspective at home. Look at verse 6 through 7, the right perspective at home. He says, therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. He's talking about the perspective. Now, we know in context that Paul is saying something here significant about death because we know that's what this context is about. That's why the therefore is there. Because it's pointing us back to verses 1 through 5. It's helping us see that Paul has already laid the groundwork that he is looking forward to the resurrected life, looking forward to being married with his resurrected body and to be fully clothed, fully glorified, both spiritually and physically. This is what his hope is in verses 1 to 5. And then he says, Therefore, being always of good courage... See, here Paul wants to encourage the reader. He wants to encourage you tonight. Paul, in both chapters, chapter 4 and chapter 5, Paul is picking up this notion of encouragement. He did this back in verse 1 of chapter 4. Look at it with me. He says, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we've received mercy, we do not lose heart. So he started this whole section with not losing heart. Don't lose heart. Be encouraged. And in context of chapter 4, he's saying in the context of ministry, don't be disheartened. 
Even though you're preaching the gospel, even though you're sharing the gospel, even though you have been given this ministry of reconciliation and you preach it, don't be disheartened when others don't respond to it. Because what does he say in verse 3? For even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Even in the reality of that, you preaching to ten people and only two of those people want Jesus, don't be disheartened that the rest of the eight don't want Jesus. Because those are perishing. Their eyes have been blinded to the gospel. Don't lose heart, is what Paul is saying. But continue, he says, to preach the gospel and to preach the gospel as the slave of Jesus Christ. Then we turn to verse 16. He says in verse 16, again, in chapter 4, he picks up that same theme, do not lose heart. And why does he tell us not to lose heart there? Because the outer man may be decaying, the the rot of the world may be decaying, but you as a Christian are being renewed day by day. And you are storing up for yourself a heavenly reward. So Paul, what is he doing? He's just encouraging these Christians. Look, have the right perspective. Don't lose heart. Don't quit. Don't quit this journey that you have been on with Jesus. Follow him. Don't quit following Jesus. And here in verse 6, he keeps that same theme up. He says, being always of good courage. And then in verse 8, he says, we are of good courage. Man, Paul is just trying to help this church, trying to help these believers to be encouraged in their Christian walk. So he has not left this theme of encouragement. And I want you to see that in verse 6. The Greek word here for this word for um, always of being good courage comes is this word of being confident. It comes from this word meaning to be courageous in life. This is what Paul wants to instill in these readers is this kind of Christian confidence. In every Christian, there ought to be a spirit of confidence that ought to come from all of our lives, right? And we could talk about where that confidence comes from. That confidence should come from our understanding that the Scripture is authoritative and it is all that we need in life. So when we have an issue, that we ought to go to the Word of God confidently knowing that the Word will speak to our issue. We ought to have confidence when we preach the gospel to a lost person that we don't have to win the argument because we know that it's the Word of God that changes the heart. See, if we don't have confidence, we fail in our walk with the Lord. Well, here Paul wants us to be confident, wants us to be of good heart. Now, when we think about our current situation, our current day, I, I, I join you that it is hard right now, I would say, to maintain that spirit of confidence when there seems to be so much corruption in the world. So many broken families. So many broken people. So much corruption from local to uh, state to federal governments. When you look across the education system in our world, when you look across... Uh, corporations, uh, whether it be Disney or beverage companies, you see the corruption and the evil that is there, and you're just going, Lord, how can we have any confidence in what you're doing in this world? Even the epidemic in our culture with so many people with gender confusion and the level of people in all governments and all agencies that are bending over backwards to affirm this insane and harmful ideology. I mean, it's mind-boggling to think that the government and institutions who were to be for the people's common good would would promote this kind of harmful behavior. It's mind-boggling. So how can Paul even here ask Christians to be optimistic don't lose heart. 
when it seems that all that is right is coming apart at the proverbial seams. I mean, we would think that Paul here did not expect society to turn out this bad. Like, Paul, did you, could you foresee in 2023 where we would be? You would have never asked us to be this optimistic. Well, I think if you look at 2 Timothy for just a minute, chapter 3, you would realize that Paul knew the condition of the human heart, knew where society would go that, would leave, that, left, that leaves God. He writes to Timothy in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, he says, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. And that is an understatement, right? For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. I mean, that last verse is a summary statement of this culture. I guess Paul did get it, didn't he? He understood the condition of humanity. If you look at Romans 1 for a minute, you get another glimpse of what Paul truly understood about the sinfulness of man. In Romans 1.18, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. So, What is said in verse 18 is that when we take God out of society, no matter if it's American culture, no matter what time frame it might be in history, no matter what label of of government you might have in a country, but when men willingly suppress the truth in unrighteousness, you can expect judgment. And that's what you have all the way through verse 19 through 31. But look at verse 32. Paul summarizes it with this. And all they know the ordinances of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Now, for the sake of time, Paul has said here that when you suppress the truth in unrighteousness, we deny God, we say God doesn't exist, God doesn't matter, and God says in that, He turns us over, He turns a people over to depravity. And that's why you see homosexuality and every stripe of sexual perversion under the sun in our culture today. So Paul knew the sinfulness of men. Paul knew the reality of what the Christian, of where I should say the Christian would live. He would live in the world. And even then he says, do not lose heart. Do not be afraid. And here he says in 2 Corinthians 5, that same statement being always of good courage. So why does Paul say this to us? Why does he say that we are to be optimistic? That we are to be of courageous, confident, ready? Because we know the future. We know who has the future. We know who holds our future. That's where confidence comes from. That's where boldness comes from. As Christians, we need to quit being like the proverbial dog with our tail between our legs running from any kind of conflict that has to do with what we know is true. And the reason I believe the world is in the situation it is, namely our culture, is because too many Christians have been passive, saying, well, I can't do anything. Well, dear friend, that is a lie. If, If Christians would stand up for the truth live the truth, be bold with the truth, be confident, quit living as if the Bible is not sufficient, 
And the reason you don't believe the Bible is sufficient because many of us don't know it well enough to use it in the public square for the glory of God. So part of our confidence comes knowing the future, right? Knowing that when I die, I'm going to heaven. What else could you do to me? But someone said, many, someone made this statement about Christians. We're, uh, we are, I don't even, I can't even think of it now. It's related to this fact of being so, so worldly that we're no heavenly good, right? And that's many of us. We're too busy building up our 401ks and our 403bs and our um, IRAs and all these different things. We're too busy trying to get promoted. We're too busy trying to get an education. When, dear friend, all this stuff is going to perish. And we're not heavenly minded to the degree that we are useful for God in this world. And I believe that Paul's power came from really understanding that reality. That's why he didn't fear death. That's why he was so outspoken. And I think we need to share some of that confidence. And that's having the right perspective here on this earth. Having the right perspective at home. Having the right perspective then will ensure or it will instill in us the right attitude while we remain on this earth in this physical body. Now, let's look at verse 6. Let's break this down and sort of get what Paul is saying here. There are a few elements here that we need to see. First, I want you to look at this phrase, while we are at home in the body. And then he, he goes on before that and says, and knowing that while we're at home in the body. This is something he says we should know. And he's assuming that, his, that these Christians he's writing to have this understanding. That while they're in the flesh, while they're in the body, he's already referred to this uh, idea in chapter w- verse 1 when he says this, for we know that if the earthly tent, he's used, pointing to that earthly tent as his body, like his body, this old earthly tent, once it dies, he's used this same, talked about this same idea in verse 16 when he says the outer man is decaying. So Paul is talking about his physical body here in verse 6 when he says while we are at home in the body. This earthly tent, this outer man, Paul is speaking directly to this earthly shell we call flesh and blood. But I want you to notice, look at the details just for a minute in verse 6. He says, And knowing that while we are at home in this body, just look at that little phrase, we are at home. What is he referring to there? I mean, he's obviously speaking to the group he's writing to, the Corinthians. But it seems to me he's, he's saying we're at home in the body like there is a disconnect, right? There's a disconnect between who you really are while you're in this body. This temporal idea, you are really someone, not someone else, but there is the real you encased, in a sense, in this physical body. So your spirit is housed, Paul is saying, in a physical body. And thus we are absent from the Lord, is what he will go on to say, because we are in this physical condition. Because he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50, that flesh and blood cannot inherit what? The kingdom of God. So he's making this point that while we are in this shell, while we're in this body, we are absent from the Lord. Now, this idea of courage that he's pointing to is this idea of being courageous while we remain in the flesh, while we sojourn in this world. Because he's saying clearly here that while we're in this flesh, we're absent from who? We're absent from the Lord. So Paul here has in mind that while we are in, the, in this earthly tent, this body, there are 
there is a real absence. There is a real separation from God. And that's what Paul is saying here. There's a spatial separation of the believer from being with Jesus while we're still in this body. That's what he's pointing to. He's talking about that. That's how he writes. Look at Philippians again. We read this. I just want you to see this spatial separation that he's referring to. In Philippians 1.23, he says, here he says, but I am hard pressed for both directions, having the desire to depart, right, and be with, look at that preposition, with who? To be with Christ. Because that is way better than being here. So Paul is acknowledging that every Christian that has ever lived, when he was on this earth, he is spatially separated from his Lord. So as long as Paul walks the earth, he is not with Jesus. But Paul's not disheartened by this spatial separation. He knows that this earthly dwelling, this temporary existence is just for a time. The spatial separation that Paul is talking about here is the same thing we share with our Lord today as well. We are separated from Jesus spatially right now. That doesn't take much for us to understand that, right? You get that. And this time is unique to your existence. Will you be able to share the gospel when you get to heaven? Will you be able to be married, raise children, work a job, serve the Lord on this earth while you're still here? Or when, once you leave here, can you do those things? No, you'll never do those things again. One thing you will not do in heaven is preach the gospel. You have only a limited amount, of time, limited amount of time to do that. The psalmist says you may get 70 years. And if you're blessed, you may get 90, right, to do that. So there are only certain things, Paul is saying, that you're going to be able to do while you remain in this particular state. It's temporary. I remember being in seminary. And those of you who are here, two of you have been in seminary that are in the audience tonight, know that when you're in seminary, you think it's never going to end. You're like, dude, i got to read another 20 books this semester and write another five or six 20-page papers, you know, and translate all the Colossians. You just feel like you're never going to survive. You're never going to get out of that. But it, guess what happens? You do get out of that. Right now, how old are you? I mean, some of you are here, you're in your 70s, your 60s, your 50s. Guess what? Your life is going to come to an end. Your ability to serve Jesus in your life will come to an end on this earth. So just by way of encouragement for us, Paul here is saying, knowing that while we are at home in this body, we are absent from the Lord, and we're absent from the Lord for a reason. See, Paul understands that even though he is in Christ as it relates to salvation, but Paul is very keenly aware that he is not with Christ. But while Paul waits for this wonderful day, all believers, including Paul, are to live our lives by faith. Look at the next verse. Verse 7, he just says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. So while we sojourn on this earth, in this body, being absent from God, our Lord, spatially, we are to live by faith. So Paul here says that his life, our Christian lives, are to be lived by faith and not by sight while we live on this earth. 
I love this statement. This little parenthetical kind of statement here that's thrown in here by Paul, reminding us how we're to live while we're absent from Jesus. Because this is really the essence of the Christian life, is to live by faith, is it not? The essence of your Christian experience is to live your life by faith in Jesus Christ and not by sight. Think of it this way, just because the believer is absent from the physical presence of Jesus, that does not mean we do not have a vibrant relationship with Jesus while in this body. That's another thing Paul is communicating here. Because we live by faith in Him. You see, while we are here in exile on this earth, waiting to one day finally see our Lord face to face, we are to live every moment by faith. You see, that faith is the guiding principle we live by each day on this earth. Faith is what... Now think of it like this. What brought you into the kingdom? We know it was the sovereign hand of God, but it was whereby grace you've been saved through what? Faith. You've been brought into the kingdom by faith, and you are to continue your walk in the kingdom by living by faith and not by sight. Paul has already said this in verse 18 of chapter 4. Look up with your eyes there. He says, while we look not at things which are seen, but at things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, are temporal. But the things which, but the things which are not seen are eternal, this is, this is a living by faith, right? Everything we see, everything we experience, we need to view it through that lens. The Christian is to live his life in complete reliance upon Jesus Christ. Now let me ask this question. Look at me here for a second. Do you live your Christian life by what you see? Think about it. Do you live your Christian life by what you see? Let's let's, let's illustrate it this way. Have you ever seen Jesus? If you have, you need to go talk to a doctor. (laughs) I mean, think about it. We as Christians do not live our lives by what we can see. We live our lives by faith. Even our own salvation is rooted in faith. Look at how Jesus put it. Look at John 20. You can't miss this. This is good. We we know old Doubting Thomas, right? Doubting Thomas after all the other disciples saw Jesus, witnessed the scars and witnessed the imprints in his hands and his feet, they believed, but what did Thomas say? He says, I'm not going to believe until I see Jesus. And then in verse 27, then he said to Thomas, Jesus appears to Thomas, reach here with your finger and see my hands, and reach here your hand and put into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Question mark. Blessed are they who do not see and yet believe. That's faith, right? That's what Jesus is saying. Blessed are those who don't see physically Jesus in their presence, but believe. Our faith in Jesus Christ obviously is a gift from God, but we do not live our lives by what we see. We live by faith in Jesus Christ. Saints throughout redemptive history show us that the Christian existence is rooted in faith every day. Look at Hebrews 11. You know we were going there. Hebrews 11 is the record of the hall of fame of faith. And we don't have time tonight to go through every single person and 
group here, but you understand, starting, let's see, in verse 23, it says, By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of, God, the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking toward, to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood so that he would destroy the firstborn and would not touch them. And it says, by faith they passed through the Red Sea as though they were passing through dry land and the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. And then we just see by faith, by faith, Rahab, by faith, all of these other believers trusted God. They didn't look to what they could see. They looked to what God could do. They believed God's word. They trusted God. This is what the author of Hebrews is saying. It's telling us that while we live in this body, on this earth, we are to be men and women of faith. Every decision we make in life must be rooted in a faith that God can do what He desires to do. We need to be people who are not afraid to take chances or take risk or to live our lives boldly because we are people of faith, but not because the size of our faith, but the size of our God that our faith is in. That's the right perspective that we are to have. So when the Apostle Paul here is talking about being absent from the Lord, he doesn't look at this as a negative example. He looks at this as something positive that we are to be encouraged about, that while we are absent from the Lord, we are to live our Christian lives by faith. But there's another perspective he gives us. It's in verse 8. It's the right perspective uh, with the Lord is how I've listed this. It's the right perspective with the Lord. Look what he says. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. So here he's talking about the right perspective to be actually with Jesus. Paul here, obviously, if you look at him, verse 8, he's using the same language, but turns the focus to being with Jesus. Right? He's turned the focus to actually uh, leaving this body and going to be with Christ. Now, here in verse 8, the apostle's not talking about his resurrected state here. He's not talking about being resurrected, giving his glorified body, and going to see Jesus. No, he's talking about in death. Look what he says. He says very clearly, absent from the body. That is clearly speaking to his death. But he says there, we are of good courage. He stated this attitude all through this section. He states it again here. And this is the kind of attitude the Christian is to have in the face of death because of who he will see, because of where he gets to go. He gets to go be with Jesus. So Paul here is asserting what every believer should look forward to, and that is being with our Lord. To no longer be absent, but to be with Christ. Look at how Paul puts it. And prefer rather to be absent. He would prefer, in comparison to his current state, right? Currently, I'm not in with the Lord. Currently, I'm here, he's saying. But I had prefer, I'd rather be absent from this body. And he's speaking here of that fleshly body. He's speaking of that shell that our spirit lives in. He is referring to a day when he will no longer have to live by faith. It'll be a day where his faith is sight. So when Paul says here in verse 9, 
and prefer rather to be absent from the body, that can only mean two things. One, it can mean that you have died. You're in a physical way. You've died physically as a Christian, and you are in heaven with Christ. That's what that could mean. Or it would mean that you have been raptured, as I said earlier, by Christ, and you're now with Jesus. That's the only two ways a Christian gets to Jesus. It's first to be saved and then to die. So when he says absent from the body, he is referring to that reality. But in both cases, you've left this old body of sin behind and are now with Jesus. So Paul here longs to be with Jesus, longs to be with Christ, and he knows that the gateway to that longing is to be absent from the body. Look at how he says this. And to be at home with the Lord. So he is talking about this reality that when his body ceases to live, he will go into the presence of Christ. Paul here is asserting that once any believer leaves this life, leaves this body, we are ushered into the presence of Jesus. Beautiful thought, isn't it? Beautiful thought to think that one day in the instant you die, you will graduate and finally get to see Jesus Christ. Paul was so consumed with Jesus, so desirous to know Jesus, so ready to see Jesus, everything he did, Everything he wrote bleeds through the text in pointing us in that direction. What we talked a little bit about the other night as we were looking at this text, someone brought up this idea of this disembodied intermediate state that believers are in uh, between their death and their resurrection, right? Their bodily resurrection. And this is what Paul here is referring to. This is that when Paul here in verse 8 says to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord, he is uh, talking about this intermediate state that all believers, even Paul, will be in until, they, until the Lord comes for the church and the resurrection happens. And Paul here is longing to be with Jesus. That's it. He's longing to be with him and not to remain on this earth. So last week, we discussed a little bit about this, this, what what happens to believers uh, when they die before the resurrection. Well, this is what Paul is referring to here. This is these disembodied souls in heaven waiting to be reunited with their resurrected body. Now, here's a couple of things I want you to understand tonight. This is a little theology on who we are as humans. we got to understand that we are made up of two entities. You are made up of a physical entity and you're made up of a spiritual entity. It's two components. This is what theologians call dichotomy or dichotomous is someone who believes that you, God made you Physically, God made you spiritual. You have two parts. A couple of verses to back this up. Genesis 1.27. If you look at that with me, you'll see clearly uh, Genesis 2.7 is actually where 27 is him saying, you know, I made man of my own image. But in 2.7 it says, Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now, there's a lot to be said here in verse 7, honestly. But what I want you to notice is how there are these two pieces. God formed man from the dust of the ground. So he's physical. Man is a physical being. Everybody here is made from that same flesh that Adam was made out of. But the unique thing about 
Man is what happens in the next phrase. And God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. This is the impartation of a soul or spirit into Adam. This is what made Adam to be clearly alive, to be distinct from the animal kingdom. No other animal, no other living creature, God did not breathe into any of them this breath of life. So man is made of two very distinct components. Matthew chapter 10 is another example of this. In Matthew 10, Jesus warns the disciples about the kind of attitude they are to have as they go into all of Israel and preach the gospel. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus warns them in verse 28, Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy the body and soul in hell. So even Jesus from his own lips is pushing this dichotomous view that you need to fear the one who can destroy you completely, soul and body. Now, there is another view called the trichotomous view where man is made up of three components, body, soul, spirit. And there's some credence to that as well. There's a uh, First Thessalonians, I believe it is, I think it's chapter 5, in verse 23, Paul writes, Now may God, the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved completely without blame at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So some people hold that, that man is made up of all three components, the spirit being who you are with God vertically and your relationship to God, your soul makes up your character, your demeanor, kind of who you are emotionally, and then, the, and then the body is obviously your physical body. But no matter what you hold, once your physical body, once, no matter if you hold that the, the tri view or the dichotomy view, it doesn't really necessarily matter. There's not too many huge implications on where you land there. But the one reality is this, when your physical body dies, right, you go into this intermediate state that Paul is actually talking about here in 2 Corinthians when he says to be absent from the body is to be where? To be present, to be with Jesus. This is that intermediate state. Now, I'm going to give you some verses to jot down. May not have time to go through these, but there are several verses that point out this intermediate state. The first verse is this particular one, 2 Corinthians 5 8. We looked at Philippians 1 23, Paul saying he, he knew that he wasn't going to be resurrected when he wrote Philippians 1 23. He knew he would die and go to be with Jesus. Um, but then you have Luke, uh, I think Josh brought this, up, brought this up the other night, Luke 9 30 and 32, at the Transfiguration. Moses and Elijah are recognized, they're fully conscious, they are there with Jesus, you know, so where have they been this whole time? They've been in heaven with Jesus. So there, that's one verse that gives us an idea of that. Then if you, ha let's look at Luke 16 for a minute. Then Luke 16, Jesus teaches us in this parable about the rich man and Lazarus. And in both of these scenarios, in verse 22, it says, Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, he, left, he, in Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And the rich man cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send this and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus bad things? But now he is being comforted here and you are in agony. But look what he adds in verse 26. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great chasm fixed 
so that those who wish to come over here to you will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. And then this rich man begs Abraham to send somebody to his brothers to warn them. Warn my brother, send somebody so they will not come into this torment. But what does Abraham say? Verse 31, but he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. If they will not listen to the testimony of Scripture and turn and repent and believe, they will not believe in a resurrected person. So both counts, you see the intermediate state here being pictured by Jesus, one in paradise, Abraham's bosom, and one in torment. Now this is not the last judgment, it hasn't happened yet. The last judgment, God will raise up every person who is without Christ and judge them according to their works and fit them for their judgment. But here we see very clearly that this is an intermediate state. One final Verse, uh, look at Acts 7. Acts 7, verse 59, this is the stoning of Stephen. And we know that the apostle Paul, or Saul, was giving uh, the okay, the thumbs up emoji uh, to kill Stephen by standing there sanctioning this death, this murder. But look, look at what happens here, though. They went out stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. Well, he didn't take a nap. He died. And this idea that he asked the Lord to receive my spirit, just communicates that in his death, his physical body was broken so bad that he quit living, but his spirit went to be with Jesus. So there is the intermediate state where we all will go if we live long enough to die on this earth. And in all of these examples, too, you can see that there is a sense of conscious life after death. Paul here is looking forward to this reality, though. Paul is looking forward to being with Christ here in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8. For him, this is where home truly is. And to be with Christ is, should be the hope of all believers. All Christians have this same hope. And that's what makes life worth living. It ought to. This is what ought to give us joy every day, knowing that our future home is with Jesus. This reality, these perspectives, knowing that our future is secure, ought to move us to serve Jesus with all our hearts. It ought to move us to evangelize. It ought to move us to serve. It ought to move us to do so many things for Jesus. Because we know our eternal destiny is secure. And next, next Wednesday night, we'll get into some of this, how it should promote certain things. Because look at verse 9. He just talks about, Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to Him. So if I remain in this flesh or I go to heaven, my ambition is to be pleasing to Jesus. So I tell people this all the time. If we can keep that right perspective in life, I want to be pleasing to Jesus. I want to be pleasing to Jesus. I want to be pleasing to Jesus. Guess how simple your life would be. Guess how more holy your life would be if we walked around with that mentality. It's my ambition to be pleasing to Jesus.